So frequently you will get a question by people who don't believe in God, if there's a God, why is all their suffering, there's um, all so much suffering in the world? In fact, uh, many people don't know this, but uh, when Billy Graham got started, it was really Billy Graham and there was another gentleman, wow, his name escapes me, you can shout it out if you remember, who started off with him and they would go, um, the two of them, from place to place and they would gather gr uh, large crowds of people and uh, that was at in, in the very beginning, it was in uh, like the mid-40s and the person who went, um, uh, the, this other man who uh, was alongside of him decided to take some time off, he went to Princeton uh, seminary who I would never recommend anyone go to Princeton Seminary but he did and he lost his faith there in God and uh, chief among his arguments was um, if there's a God why would he allow all the suffering in the world and uh, at some point you're going to be asked the question why does God allow suffering and I don't, uh, the, probably the, burst, uh, the, the best response in, in my opinion is uh, first to say, well, I don't know, I, I'm not God, and I don't have all the answers to these things. But the, the second uh, answer that I give, really, is, and that I focus on, is that when God gave man a free will, he gave him a very dangerous thing. You know, when I have my children, the things that the thing that makes it so wonderful about my kids, particularly now they're uh, past teenage years and they're in their 20s, uh, they have decided to love their mother and father out of their own free will. I am not turning around on their back, pressing a button that says the love button, love, love, love. That's what makes it so rich to have kids who are f making a free will decision to love me. It's the same way with God. When he gave us, uh, but, but, but I will say it, 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 was, it was a dangerous thing because every child um, has the capacity to go and reject their parents and never love them for the rest of their lives. In fact, I know people who have done that. They hated their parents. I know a person who recently died. He hated his parents until the day of his death. Um, and, uh, but that's what makes it so rewarding is that they can choose not to love me, but they ch freely choose to love me. It's the same um, uh, it, it's the same with God. Man has the capacity to either reject God by his own free will or to love God by his own free will. Now, that free will that, uh, that, that, um, that God uh, has given man, the Lord in his sovereign purposes gave it to each human being the ability to reject God and reject the love of God and, and really just love self. And, and loving self, which there's a word for it, it's sin, S-I-N, sin, has, re, re, you, you, if you look at human suffering, 99% of it, not 100% of it, is tied back to sin. And sin is something that man in their own free will has chosen. And so if you look, for example, at starvation in the world, um, it's, it's tied back to sin. Uh, men, women in places of power refusing to uh, do certain things to free up food from getting to the right people. Uh, human suffering, if you look at the city, um, and the gang violence in, in this city and the suffering in this city is due to um, fathers or mothers or both just choosing just to reject God and, 
and live their lives the way they want and allowing their kids to live the way they want. God, when he gave us a free will, gave us a very dangerous thing, but it was worth it to him. Love is worth it. Someone wrote me a, a, a text last week. And they, say, they said, Pastor Steve, a Muslim person asked me if there's such a thing as hell. Why did God even make the world? And the only response I've ever been able to think of for that, which has satisfied some, is that love is worth it. God thought love was worth it. Like when I bring my kids into the world, I know that they can choose to reject me, reject my wife, reject God, and, and ultimately go to hell. But love is worth it. Love is such a powerful, strong thing that we bring our kids into the world. I remember in the 70s and 80s, there was a very famous show. It was called All in the Family. It was starring Carol O'Connor. Just house, it was a household. Every, everyone knew about All in the Family. And I remember Carol O'Connor, he's like this ornery old white guy in Brooklyn or Queens or something like that. And he was, he had all kinds of issues, but he had a, he was very sort of right-wing conservative, but he had a daughter who was very liberal politically, and his daughter's, um, his daughter's, uh, who was Sally Struthers, and his, his, his daughter's husband was a guy, was it Rob Reich? But anyway, his name was, his father called him Meathead. And Meathead and, and the, two, the two liberal ones, they refused to have kids because they said, why would I ever bring kids into this world? And it's a fair question. Knowing that they have the capacity to just trash their lives and make a mess of their lives and reject God and, and, and everything else, why bring kids into the world? The answer is love is worth it. That, 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 that parents reach this conclusion. Ultimately, God chose the same thing. Love was worth it. People say, uh, people say, why did God create the world? I, I believe there's really two answers. The glory, to, um, for his glory. Jonathan Edwards wrote a book, The Purpose for Which God Made the Earth, which was glory. But, you know, the, the problem in the book, is I, as I read it, the, he struggles with, well, where does love fit in? And, uh, and I think it's a good, it's interesting that he struggles with that. It's hard to not also answer both. The glory of God and the essence of God who is love were the reasons God made the world. It was worth it to him. Now why am I talking about this? Why have I just spent 15 minutes talking about this? Because the book of Job is the most outstanding example in the Bible of the beauty of choosing out of our own free will to follow God. And we read in the first chapter that the sons of God, meaning the angels, go before God and, and one of them is Satan. And God says to Satan, what have you been doing? He's going, I'm going to and fro throughout the world. And, uh, and uh, God asks Satan, he says to him, well, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless man and upright who fears God and shuns evil. Meaning, there's none like him on the earth. He was the most righteous man on the planet. And what is Satan, you know, it, and, and, and Satan's going to and forth uh, from the earth. Does Satan, has, does he know who Job is? Absolutely. When you decide to walk with God and be blameless, Satan is going to know all about you. And Satan's response to God is, yeah, I know about Satan, and the only reason he follows you is because you've put a hedge around him and you've blessed him so much, you take away his blessing and he will curse you. He will curse you to your face. It says that in verse 11. When you follow the Lord, Satan will notice.
And so the Lord tells Satan, he goes, okay, uh, go ahead. Let's see if he's choosing to love me freely or is he doing it just because I'm blessing him. Go ahead, take away his blessings. The only thing I don't want you to do is to touch his body, meaning to leave his health as it is. So what happens Satan goes, he, take, he kills all the servants of Job with the sword. He destroys his house. He kills his ten children. And verse 20 says, Job arose, he tore his clothes, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship. Now consider, all of heaven is watching Job at this moment. Is there such a thing as a person who out of their own free will, not because God's pressing some button on the back of their um, back saying, love God, love God, love God, you know, like a puppet, but someone out of their own free will, all of heaven is looking on. I mean, this is high drama. And what does Job do? Someone, someone shouted out, what does he do? He worships the Lord. <laughs> You're wrong, Satan. He didn't curse God. He wasn't following God because of all his blessings. As he fell to the ground and worshiped God, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Now, we just went down to Brazil. We also went to Peru. And one of the tragic um, things that the, Peru was where uh, Freddie got, w walked around in public with those shoes. In public, Freddie did. But not too many people saw him. Only people who also had muddy shoes saw him. And maybe a couple others when he arrived. But... Um, uh, the tragic thing about the United States, you know, the United States exports, um, has exported probably more, well, easily more missionaries than any other country in the history of the world. I, I think that's very safe to say. In fact, I would say probably five times more or ten times or a hundred times more. But it's also exported evil in the form of the prosperity gospel. And... The prosperity gospel is a gospel that if you follow the Lord, he will make you wealthy. Over time, he'll make me wealthy. Now, it is required to, to give our church your money, if that's going to happen, but he will do it. And it is wildly popular in Brazil and in Peru. And I have so much respect for the pastors in these countries, including the, the pastor, particularly the one in Brazil, to small church, preaching the Word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's hard when down the street there's a church of 5,000 people filled with people and they're preaching to them, God will make you rich, God will make you rich, God will make you rich. Some people say, well, why does God allow that? Why does God allow such a thing? Well... This is what the people want who go. They want to get rich. They're just exposing their own heart. These are not innocent victims who are going to these churches, at least not most of them. And so um, I bring them up because this book is an indictment against that preaching. And they have all kinds of crazy things that they have to say about the book of Job. But there's no way around it. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. No way around it. So clear in the Bible, First Peter says, why do you guys think it's strange the suffering that you are going through? Don't think it's strange. Part of the Christian life. And, and the Bible says that, and, and, and I, I said this just a few Sundays ago, if you go out and you make a lot of money and you're driving around in a Mercedes and things like this, no one's going to come to the Lord as a result of that. True repentance to the Lord. I have, a, I have a dear friend. He drove around in a Mercedes and 
And I asked him why, and he goes, it's to give people hope. And he says, I was in the, in the drive-thru in the bank the other day, and, and someone came to me, and, and they looked at me, and they could see I was a Christian. I guess he was wearing some Christian shirt, and it gave them hope that someday they could get, uh, have a Mercedes like me. Well, that's, that, that's no kind of hope at all. A hope in having a Mercedes is, is not the kind of hope that is going to bring anyone lasting peace, joy, lasting peace and, and, and joy and, uh, and, and a correct, prosperous way of living their life, fulfillment in life. It's by knowing the Lord. Here's a guy who knows the Lord. Everything is taken away, although his health is not yet taken. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name. Meaning God is good. He can say that even though everything was taken away. Chapter 2, let's start there. It says, in, um, because we were in chapter 1 last week. It says in verse 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God, in this context the sons of God meaning angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. He's kind of coming with his tail in between his legs because he had just been proven wrong. And the Lord said to Satan, Ah, it's you again. Where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on, uh, uh, on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord said to him, verse 3, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity although you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause meaning he hadn't done anything at all to sort of deserve this thing that happened to him you challenged me and i accepted the challenge and so i, I and i agreed to it Remember, Job hasn't read the book of Job. Very important. Job hasn't read the book of Job. If he had read the book of Job, he, he would have been able to just bite his tongue and, and wait until God finally restores him, which happens at the end. It says he still holds fast to his integrity. That remind anyone of anything? He still holds fast to his integrity. Anyone? Anyone want a, a one of those stickers? I'll put the sticker on your forehead. How about the sermon last Sunday? The sermon last Sunday on Sunday morning. Says in Philippians chapter two, as we're going through, be a Christmas star. In verse fifteen, it says, "Become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." And what was one of the ways that I discussed? Shine his light in the world. Anyone remember? Is my wife really going to be the only one who answers? Come on. Uh, uh, okay, what was another way? Otro manera. Stop. Lying. In other words, integrity. 
uphold your integrity in the world. And I gave several examples of, uh, a couple of examples of people who chose integrity over their livelihood. I gave another example of someone who did not have integrity, a Christian, and repented. It says here, there is no way that we are going to shine as a light in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, Philippians 2, 15, if we do not have integrity. The amazing thing about the book of Job, it's that it's not even, it's not as much even talking about this crooked and generation, although certainly he was a light in this generation. But in Ephesians 3, 9, it says this shocking, shocking thing. It says, by and through the church, rather it's Ephesians 3, 10, by and through the church, that means you and your integrity, it says, the wisdom of God will be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So if you think it's just Job, you're wrong. It's you too. You shine as a star. When you shine as a star, you're doing it not only in the midst of a wicked and crooked generation, it's also, there's an audience, it's the, according to Flip, uh, Ephesians 3.10, the audience are the very angels of God, including demonic angels, including demonic entities. And God says to Satan, he still holds fast to his integrity. When you hold fast to your integrity, it will shine as a light in this crooked and twisted generation who's taken every beautiful thing, like we talked about on Sunday morning, every beautiful thing God has given us, sex, money, thick dance, and he's twisted it, something that is not beautiful, it's ugly. Shine as a light by holding fast to your integrity. He says he holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him, destroy him without cause. Verse 4. Satan doesn't give up. What, what did we say last week was the definition of the word Satan here, actually, in the Hebrew? Is what? What, what? A liar? That's good. Satan is a liar, but the actual meaning here is accuser, adversary, an adversary, an accuser. And, and so he's just an accuser. Ever met someone like that? No matter what, no matter what you do, they are finding some way to accuse you. That is who Satan is. That's his name. The adversaries called that in Revelation, I think it's chapter 12. So Satan doesn't give up. Can you imagine, you know, you're not going to win an argument with God. But, but uh, we try, don't we? We really try to win our arguments with God. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will suddenly... He will surely curse you to your face. In other words, okay, yeah, I killed his ten sons. I took away all his possession, all his sheep, and all that stuff I destroyed. How many sheep did he have? 10,000. Those went too, didn't they? Yep. And 7,000 sheep. All of them were des destroyed. All his sheep. He says, yeah, I know I took away his sheep, I destroyed his sheep, his servants, his kids, his house. But he still has his, he still has his health. I mean, he can start another business and become a millionaire. But not if he, you take his health. Not if you strike his health. Fill his body with pain. You do that, he'll curse you. Be your face. Oh, Satan, he's got some serious guts, doesn't he? 
says, he will surely curse you to your face. He's telling that to God. Someone's, you know, since same stupid thing about you walking obedient. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. In other words, okay, you do what you want with his health, but you can't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the soil of his, rather, from the sole of his foot, crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd, meaning a piece of pot, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? All this Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends, well, well before I go on, so, you know, I, I, I do have to repent because I've been a little too hard on Job's wife in the past because she did lose ten children. I mean, can you imagine losing every one of your kids, ten of them, And this is a history. Remember we talked about this last week. We've ended the history books. This is a book of poetry, but that doesn't mean this actually happened in history. We weren't here last night. Rather, last week you can go back and hear that. It actually happened. This actually, this kind of thing, you know, this kind of thing, the, the, these kind of calamities do happen to Christians. Rare. Woman lost ten, ten children. But I will say this, but still, sorry, God help you. Now, Freddie and I talk about this a lot. Sorry, Freddie, got to talk about you. You're, here. you're and, and you're on the front row, so. And, he, you know, he's single, and we're praying for the right woman for Freddie. And, you know, it's something that he really needs to, to seek the Lord. And anyone who's single, he's not the only single person in the room. You get to seek the Lord as to whom you marry. And I will tell you this. Any person who has half a brain isn't going to know how to speak the Christian language. They're going to know how to respond if they get interested in you. When they see you and their heart's going boom, 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 they're going to be able to figure out enough Jesus language to convince you or to try to convince you, oh, wow, this, yeah, this person's a Christian. I tell you, I've been a pastor for many years. I've seen a lot of tragedy. That's why when it comes to things of the heart, don't trust your own heart. You better go to people who you trust and say, okay, my heart's pounding for this man, for this woman. What do you think? Job's wife was a woman who was okay with God as long as God was blessing her. The problem with that is that life is hard. Live in a world that is fallen, that Satan has his, his way in this world, and life is hard. And if you marry a person all happy with God, when things are going right, but when things get taken away, all of a sudden it's, well, a free-for-all in terms of 
you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So God, God help you. Serious thing. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? First God and die. This, this book is such an important book to help us to do life. It's as important as any book in the Bible to help us do life. <clears throat> I tell you, as a pastor, I am constantly faced with counseling situations, people who are more or less like Job's wife. They're fine with God as well as he acts like Santa Claus. The problem with Santa Claus is he's a fiction. He doesn't exist. No such thing as a God who just, the blessing after blessing after blessing rather than adversity. Circling back, because I think I never finished my point. When you are prospered greatly, no one's going to follow you because you have a Mercedes Benz, but when you fall into adversity, serious adversity, you'll have a joy that resonates for you. Now, that'll get the world's attention. That will. When you still follow God and everything around you has fallen apart, that will get the world's attention. But a Mercedes, I'm not knocking Mercedes. Just you better be, better be really, really sure about before you buy one. That, that's what the Lord wants you to do. But that's not going to bring anyone to the Lord. But this is the life that gets our attention, doesn't it? And gets the attention of the world. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And so... It looks from here, she's not even interested in him anymore. Even if he does curse God, she's not interested in him. Looks to me like she's bolting uh, from him. Like my husband, what good is he for now? Yeah, I know, I said on my wedding day to death, in, in, in sickness or in health, Death do us part. I know I said that, but now that I'm faced with a really, really sick husband and I'm going to have to take care of him for the rest of my life, I'm out of here. That appears to be what she's doing. And again, she lost 10 children. So I, I do understand um, here, woman is going to have issues if that happens. But let me tell you, there is a kind of woman, she can lose everything exact same thing. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. The Lord take is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job says to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So, all of heaven is looking on. And I think there's an eruption of worship in heaven. Because the Lord didn't press a button in his back to make him do this. Now that's a mystery. I get it. It's a mystery. I also get the theology if you let one mo molecule allow free will to even one molecule you God is risking the entire universe is going to go up in flames I get that I think the Bible teaches both things but that's the beauty of the book of Job is this guy is 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 is, uh, is, is, is choosing to follow God so I, I believe all heaven is erupting in a in a chorus and I am telling you, believer in Christ, follower of Jesus Christ, in your obedience, heaven rejoices. 
the Bible says it. The Bible says that. Follow him. Heaven rejoices. When you follow him obedient, make those really hard decisions, like a couple of decisions. I, brothers, I, I talked to you about on Sunday morning and basically have to say, okay, I'm going to get fired, but I'm not going to lie here. Heaven rejoices. Verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all his, this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the, Naph, the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. When they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. I don't know if you've ever visited someone in a hospital room. Remember, it happened at least once with me. Who was a pastor who I know very, very well. First Calvary Chapel pastor that um, I knew in Massachusetts, in fact. Tony Marinella, and he got leukemia, and then he got some other... Terrible. Tracked it in the hospital where it attacked, attacked all his mucus um, organs, and so he lost his eyesight. All kinds of other things happened wherever he congregated. And I went in, and he was almost unrecognized. Very difficult. It says that when they saw Job, like a really thing thing, lifted their voices, and each one tore his clothes, or rather each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief very Now, unfortunately, these guys are going to go on and they're going to open their mouth and they're going to say a lot of stupid stuff, like incredibly stupid stuff. Unfortunately, that's what we do a lot of times when we open our mouth. But they did really well for the first seven days. They just, they were just with him in silence. And sometimes as a friend, that's the best thing that you can do. One of your friends is in suffering. It's just being with them. Not trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Say, hey, why is this happening? Say, you know, but I, you know, I, I can pray for you. And then you pray for them. But when they start giving advice, that they start getting into a lot of trouble. Psalm 141, verse 3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors, over the door of my lips. Verse 19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. He who restrains his lips, wise. Proverbs 17, 27 says, He who has knowledge spares his words. Even a fool, verse 28, is counted wise when he holds his peace. Meaning, meaning when he quiet. Chuck Smith's famous expression, I don't know if it originated with him, but it says, um, better to keep your mouth shut Make people think you are a fool and to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Proverbs 18, verse 2 says, A fool has 
No delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. Proverbs 21, 23 says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue stole from trouble. Proverbs 29, 20 says, do you see a man hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And not to leave the New Testament out, beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. It says they didn't speak for, for seven days. It says, for they saw that his grief was very great. After seven days, chapter 3 says, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Now, from this point on, you're not going to see. Twice it says that Job did not sin with his lips. From this point on, he's going to be sinning with his lips. He's not perfect. No one's perfect. He's cursing the day of birth. You know, the Lord, and, 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 and look, it, I, I would, I'm sure I would do a thousand times worse than, than Job. But to be sure of this, never curse the day of your birth. God wants to do an ex. So it is sin. It's wrong. Curse the day of your birth, no matter how bad things get. He cursed the day of his birth. He spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born, the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. May the day be darkness, may God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it, may a cloud settle on it, may the blackness of the day terrify it. As, as for that night, may darkness seize it, may it not rejoice among the day, days of the year, may it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those, those curse it who curse the day, those who ready to rouse the Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light, but have none, and not see the dawning of the day, because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide sorrow from my eyes. So he's just, he doesn't know what's going on. He's not cursing God. He begins an argument with God. Interesting how, um, you know, it, it, it begins it's seven days a after this time where his, his friends greet him. All his physical blessings have taken, um, taken away, but then, the Lord struck also his body. Health. I did have an experience like this. It's been a long time since I've shared it. You know, I've 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 told you guys this in the first two years of the of, of our church. There were more and, and actually technically also before, there were more we had more spiritual warfare, Stephanie and me, and, and all the other years combined. One of the things that happened is I was struck with tremendous pain in my neck. And I had a doctor in prescribing. After a while, he started prescribing narcotics, and I was able to go to work, and I was on... He had me on maximum fentanyl and methadone. At, I don't know if it was maximum methadone. At the same time, I was, in, in order to, to just be able to work, in order to be a pastor, and, and, and this, is, this is happening to me, and the pain is getting worse and worse and worse, and the prescriptions are going up and up and up, and 
I come into the, the doctor one day, and he had come in, and uh, his administrator said, well, he came in today, but he had to leave. He had to go to the hospital. There's an emergency, and it turns out he had pancreatic cancer, died six months later. So I went back to another doctor, and when he found out the amount of medication I was on, he said, listen, you're just going to have to live in pain. You can't to be on this, these prescriptions. And, um, and so I, I decided that I would just get off all these um, pain medications, and it was terrible. My body went through withdrawal, so I know about all that stuff. I didn't do it the right way. I, I should have weaned myself off, but I just went off in a really terrible. And Steffi and I tried to go to different places, people who were supposedly experts in pain. And we went to one person, and she was expert in some kind of skull manipulation. Stephanie, do you remember the name of that procedure? Cranial sacral movements where they just take your this and they do things and it makes your pain go away and and it's you know I go into the office and it got me nervous because they had some uh, they had some uh, they had some advertisements for Reiki Reiki is um, it's just like a demonic way of getting physical healing it's just not any different than Santeria or voodoo, it's this Japanese thing where they believe there's a universal energy that's transferred from the palms of the practitioner to, to the patient. Now, this woman didn't do Reiki because, I, as I understand it, cranial sacral is a legitimate, it can be a legitimate, but I'm in the middle of this thing. I don't, Stephanie, I don't remember if you were in the room, but this woman is do, like trying to do some stuff to minimize my pain, and she starts calling on the name of Jesus Christ. She starts calling on Jesus, come into this room. And uh, I, somehow I knew she was not a Christian. And I asked her after, I go, well, why were you calling on the name of Jesus? She goes, well, I don't believe in him, but I, 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 I'm thinking, I, you know, you believe in him, so uh, I'm just going to call on Jesus' name. And uh, that made me... That was like, wait, I, I'm not doing this anymore. I this is like weird spiritual stuff. And I remember this Reiki thing. And, and so in my own mind, it was the same thing. I just had to say, I have to, I have to follow the Lord and be obedient to the Lord, even if it means. It was a, it was a watershed moment. Because this woman was like, in my own mind, it was my last hope. And it was a, it was a very, very, very difficult time. And I, I, I went home and I was in my bed and I was like weeping in pain. And I remember uh, I was weeping and weeping and weeping and, because I was in so much pain. And... Uh, I started in Isaiah chapter 40, and I just started reading. And by the way, I'd stepped down from being a pastor because I couldn't function. Pastor Scott was in the pulpit for like six weeks. And um, so I was in Isaiah chapter 40, and I started reading the end of Isaiah, and it was just so rich and powerful and incredible. And I, and I got to... Uh, and I got to Isaiah chapter... Chapter 53, verse 4, which says, Surely he has borne our... ...priests, and he has carried our... It says, it actually, it, um, in NIV, I see, I, which I was reading at the time. At, do you have your NIV on you? Ready? What does um, verse 4 say of... Uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
So um, it says, surely he has borne our infirmities, in verse 4, and it says, by his stripes we're healed. And I, I just... I just, I just read that verse and I said, Lord, I have all this pain, yet I have this, and I have all this pain, but this says you, you've borne, you've borne my pain. And, and within days it was gone completely. Then a couple days, completely. Now some people do live out the rest of their life in pain. But it's just so important that when you reach that watershed moment where you're thinking of, do I follow God and live the rest of my life with this thing, pain, a physical thing, or do I just go and do my own? And one of the tragedies in Haiti, I times, and there's so much poverty in the medical system so bad that many people resort to voodoo Church on Sunday, but they resort to voodoo during the week. Can't afford to go to a doctor. But it's always going. Always going to death. It's like planting. Death will start having its way in your life. Finances, and ultimately, hell. But it, it, but it was it was the physical pain that you know led Job to really start saying, "I just wish I." Start sitting with his mouth, and I'm not saying, by the way, you should not. Not bring your complaint to the Lord. Again, from last Sunday, Philippians chapter 2. One of the ways we shine like lights in this crooked and perverse generation, it says that we do everything without complaining or disputing. That's how we shine as a light in this crooked, perverse genera- generation. We do everything without complaining and disputing. And what did I say? I said, before you ever take a complaint or a dispute, man, bring it first to the Lord. Quoted Psalm 61, like, from the ends of the earth I called on me, listen to my complaint, Lord. Take your complaint to the Lord. And this is a dialogue with the Lord here. It's a dialogue with the Lord where he's saying, where he's just putting before the Lord, oh, wow, I wish that may the day perish on which I was born. And then he says, verse 11, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why, did, why the breast that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. When kings and counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves or with princes who had gold, who had filled their houses with silver, or why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw light, so a baby that's born stillborn. He's like, why would, could I not have been like that? There the wicked cease from troubling and there the weary are at rest. There the, the prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. So, you know, at this point, this is the earliest book written in the Bible. They don't really, he doesn't have much of an understanding what happens after death. And he's just thinking, you know, the people who were living very difficult lives, like prisoners and people like that, uh, poor people, they're dead and they're free from all their suffering, which we know is not true. But um, this is uh, far, this is, the Bible says in Timothy, the gospel brought light, uh, Jesus Christ brought light and immortality to the, to the gospel, meaning we, we understand so much more about life and death um, through Jesus Christ. Um, but he's just saying, he's just, 
He's crying out here, verse 20, Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul? So he doesn't know at this point that 2,000 years later, on December 26 in Boston, there's going to be a bunch of people reading his book, getting, being encouraged, being helped by it. He doesn't know that. Neither do you know when you're in great trial how the Lord's going to use it someday and somehow. It, it, it's going to seem that there's no possible way that this could be beneficial for everyone. Wrong. The Lord's going to use it for His glory. But Job doesn't know that now. Verse 21, who, they long for death, but it does not come and search for it more than hidden treasures, meaning they want to die more than a, getting a, tr a treasure. Verse 22, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Meaning, why does God keep people alive? Even after they're in great suffering, we don't know. We just know that the Lord knows how to do the glory thing. He knows how to get His glory. He's going hard after His glory. He does that. And the Lord knows. Verse 24, For my sighing comes before I eat. My groanings pour out like water. For the things, thing I greatly feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. And so we are going to, <laughs> we are going to conclude there. Now all of this is going to have a good end. And look, you know, we're going to be in this next week. So it's the last, it's the last Tuesday of the year. It's the first Tuesday of the year. We're going to be in the book of Job it does not mean that the next year is going to be like this awful year. That's not what Job is about. I've read Job many times, and, and my life after reading it does not significantly change one way or another. But life is filled indeed with calamity. And this book is so good to be able to, to manage that, to know God is good. And sometimes the Lord has to be silent. He doesn't give us silent in the sense that He's not going to tell us specifically why we're going through something, but He will communicate His love. This I do know. We're in a better covenant. We have the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, we can, we can be crying out to God. But, you know, we don't, we, we, uh, we're at the end of our time here. Uh, Freddie, can we end with a, with a worship song? So let's end with a worship song because, listen, that's what Job did, right? And that's what we wanted to. It says what, everything that happened to him, he still, it says he tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshiped. Well, you know, we don't have all this stuff happening to us right now. But we want to worship the Lord as well. There's no, I was reading my devotional this morning, Bogatsky, my devotional, Bogatsky. His name is Bogatsky. He just made the comment that being with the Lord is a hundred, hundred times better than anything else. I'm like, that is so true. I wish somehow I could get that into people so that they could, could realize that as well. But let's, let's thank Him for that. Let's bless Him for that. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.